Hey. So thank you for the intro. Yeah, my name is David McAllis. I work here in London as a data journalist and information designer. And that means that I just love uh, gathering data, all kinds of data, numbers, ideas, statistics, and then visualizing that data in graphical images that anyone can understand. And I'd like to go a step further and take that visualized information and design it so that it reveals something interesting or allows us to focus on something important in the sea of data surrounding us, or so that it tells a story. And that's the data journalism side. So when you, I think when you do this, when you gather data, analyze it, visualize it, and design it, strange and interesting and even quite magical things start to happen. So I want to show you some examples of that today. I want to start with uh, what data is usually made up of and what we're swamped in typically, which is billions. So, um, <clears throat> uh, 500 billion for this war, 600 billion for this takeover. I mean, these numbers routinely circulate around the media, but they're, they're actually quite mind-boggling. They're hard to grasp. They're too vast, really, in a way. So, um, frustrated by this, I scraped a load of these numbers um, from various news sources and then visualized them like this. So, this is a diagram that I call the billion dollar o -gram. And here, uh, the blocks here are scaled according to the amounts. And the colors here represent the motivation behind the money. So green is revenue, pink is giving money away, and so on. So by taking these huge numbers and, and visualizing them like this, this is a, this type of diagram is called a tree map, um, you immediately have a different kind of relationship to these numbers. You can literally see them before you. But more importantly, you can start to see patterns and connections between numbers that would otherwise be separated across multiple news reports. You'd never see them together. So I quite like this one. This pink block in the left here. This is how much is given by the American people to charity every year. Very generous people, the Americans. 300 billion a year. And you can contrast that with the amount given in foreign aid by the top industrialized nations. This little block down here, just 120 billion. So stories start to emerge when you get these connections going. Uh, obviously, there's a big one here. The Iraq war, the predicted cost in 2003, and then, as you can see, that's ballooned a little since then. Um, so, visualizing it turns the information into an information map, and then you can start deriving insight, patterns, connections, the interesting stuff. Um, I did a similar thing for the UK budget. This is the UK budget. Uh, I was slightly less interesting because it's a bit more local, but I wanted to see that our budget deficit here in the UK that's the black hole in our finances, 175 billion pounds. And as you can see again, in contrast, it's bigger than we earn from income tax every year, 152 billion. So that's one hell of an overdraft that we're struggling with. But we're still here a little bit in the realm of billions. We're still celestial. I can't quite get my head around these numbers. I can't quite relate to them. Um, so I wondered, is there a way I can convert these numbers into something a bit more understandable, a bit more easy to relate to? So I took the same numbers and converted them into this metric. So these are the same numbers, but now how much I contribute as an average taxpayer per day to these various silos. And the thinking here is, well, I don't know exactly how much I spend a year, maybe not a month, but I definitely know how much I spend a day. So it's a number I can relate to. It's a data set I can relate to. Um, and as you can see, the NHS, the free health service here, costs about nine pounds a day if you're an average taxpayer. Museums, um, three pence a day, quite reasonable. And Scotland, £2.93. <laughs> Any Scots in? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Always best to check. Um, so, you know, maybe independence might be good value. Um, so that as a data journalist, I'm trying, whenever possible, to bring this data down to earth so we can start to relate to it and start to unveil its stories, start to understand it a bit better. Um, so I, when I created this diagram, back to this one, I, I couldn't quite get these connections out of my mind. I, I became quite fascinated with them. So I took them and had a little play and created a little animation, a little film, based on these connections, and I'll show you. It's called Detris.
There you go. Thank you. Thanks. So I, allow my, I like to allow myself to play and play with the data and see what comes out, see what kinds of stories I can find. Um, and patterns are the thing, the gold, really, in data. Um, and I want to show you another pattern right now. Again, a little media preoccupied. At this one time, about fear. Uh, again, I was perceiving in the media, there seems to be something we're scared of every couple of years, something, some big fear that's amplified by the media and we become terrified. So I created a timeline of the world's biggest fears. Um, and this is it. So I'm going to label this for you. Obviously, we've got time along the bottom. And the y-axis here is intensity. The number of times each of these fears has been mentioned in the press. I'm going to label this. So here's swine flu. Remember that? <laughs> um, bird flu, yellow here. Uh, SARS. Remember SARS? <laughs> this little grey spike here is uh, the millennium bug. Oh, we were terrified of that. Uh, the green bumps here, asteroid collisions. <laughs> And in the foreground, these blue humps are killer wasps. <laughs> so these are our biggest fears as amped up by the media. Um, and again, this is a pattern you couldn't see in a spreadsheet. You really have to visualize it to be able to see it. Um, what's curious for me is that um, as I was exploring this data set, I found this pattern. So this is the shape for violent video games. The idea that you know, Grand Theft Auto and so on are, are corrupting our youth. And so you can see there's a regularity to this pattern. Twin peaks every year. If you look closer at the data, you can see these peaks occur in the same months every year. So in November and April, November, April, every year, there's this resurgence of fear or this spike in concern. And I don't know why exactly, but I've got a few theories. In November, I'm thinking Christmas video games come out. There's usually one the press are lights on. April isn't a particularly massive month for video games. But I, have, I wonder, there is something that can, pushes that fear up into the, into the group mind. Has anybody... You might want to guess what that might be. Daily Mail. Daily Mail, yeah. <laughs> the Daily Mail, exactly. <laughs> it's just the sole engine of fear. It's true. Um, actually, it's a little tragic. Um, in April 1999 was the Columbine shooting. And that school tragedy was linked to violent video games. And since then, there have been uh, court cases, retrospectives, even copycat shootings. So now when one is mentioned, Final video games, the other is closely mentioned alongside. So the two push each other into the memory, into group memory, as it oscillates down the years. So the patterns are lurking there in the data for us to find, unusual and unexpected opening questions. There was another one in here that I saw that I didn't notice initially, but you see how all the stories, they die away a little bit to the left and then they begin again, there's a gap. And if you look closely at where that gap begins, it's around about September, 2001, when we had something very real to be scared about. So that's the promise. That's the promise of our Caesar data that we're sucking in through our APIs and trying to get business intelligence out of them. Um, and they form landscapes. I want to show you another landscape now of data. This next image went a bit viral. So if you know the answer to this next question, don't say. And let's just see. Let's test your minds right now. I want to try and guess what this data set might be. What peaks? twice a year, once around about Easter, then just before Christmas, has twin peaks, or well, little peaks coming out um, every Monday, and then flattens out in the summer. Any ideas? Chocolate? You might want to get some chocolate in. Jesus? Jesus? Did you say Jesus? Fair enough, you might want to turn to Jesus in this situation? All right, I'll show you. Let's see. So, most common breakup times. We scraped uh, quite a few, maybe hundreds of thousands of um, Facebook status updates. And this is the pattern we found. Um, an odd peak around April Fool's Day. Got sure what's going on there. <laughs> People rolling out bad weekends, we're thinking on the Mondays, self-reporting. A clear out before the summer, because you want to be young, free, and single for the summer. And then the lowest day of the year, of course, Christmas Day. <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> so this is the promise, like I said, of big data, uh, of the seas of data surrounding us. We're generating so much of it per day, per minute, per hour, per second. Uh, Twitter, Facebook. Um, it's leading to this phrase that I hear quite a lot, you may have heard it as well, that data is the new oil. This idea that data is this new ubiquitous resource that we can mine for insight and intelligence and products. 
And I think that's true. It's a good metaphor. But I would adapt it slightly. And for me, as a, as a writer and a designer, I would say data is a new soil. Soil. Because um, for me, it feels more like a material, a new kind of material that you can um, dig through and mold and till and treat in a certain way. And if you do it, in, if you treat this soil in, in the right way, then data visualizations, infographics, they're like um, flowers that bloom from this soil. They're like the beautiful things that spring from this data soil. And of course, this oil also has another name. I, I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It's called big data. Familiar at all? Um, we're hearing a lot about this, and obviously APIs are deeply linked with this, being able to draw it in from varied sources, high velocity uh, data, and be able to compile it and derive your insights from it. I, I got a little confused about big data because it's, it is an, it's, a, it's a noun, but it actually describes a process. Like visualization, it's actually a verb. And it's, it's a, a six-part process as I see it. The gathering and handling of data, that's the initial stage. Then the structuring and examining, that analysis phase. And then discovery and delivery of any insights. And I put a line here because th these two these two phases are not necessarily a given. You really can cycle in this area for quite a while, unless you have a goal or a question or inquiry or a solid business intention that you want to derive from the data. There's so much of it. You really need a thread to lead you through. Um, and when I, I like to play with data, and sometimes my threads are a little frivolous, my questions are a little light, but you know, I'm curious. And one day I was a bit curious whether horoscopes, do they all just say the same thing? Um, I don't know much about horoscopes, but that's the rumor. So um, unfortunately, uh, I wanted to use Yahoo's um, horoscope database for this. They don't have an API. So I had to screen scrape a lot of this data. But I screen scraped 60,000 of them and did a word frequency analysis. So here are the most common words for each star sign in this meta horoscope. And you can make up your own minds whether they say the same things. The red words here are. Um, words that are unique to each star sign. So we can say uh, Taurians. Any Taurians here? Just one at the front. Great. Uh, you're open, but you worry a lot, apparently, according to the horoscopes. Uh, any Virgos here? Yep, a bit more, 10%. Uh, you're totally perfect. Um, if you're curious, you know, when you haven't got an API on a site, um, if you, how do you scrape this stuff? Uh, the best way to do it is to get a little developer. They don't have to be Russian, but you know, it helps if they are, haven't they? <laughs> Write you a little Python script that pings the Yahoo server and scrapes everything. Of course, you have to be careful because if you ping it too hard, the Yahoo thinks that you're hacking the site and they ban your IP address for a week. So um, after three weeks, we were able to isolate the correct frequency to prevent those countermeasures from triggering. So uh, it's one tenth of a second if you're curious about <laughs> doing any scraping. Anyway, and then we gathered all these data, and then I created this chart. Cool. Then it struck me, OK, I've got this data now. Now I can create, I've got the most common words across all the star signs. I can create a single prediction that applies to every single star sign every single day of the year, a meta prediction, right? So here it is, top 40 words. Whatever the situation or secret moment, enjoy everything a lot. <laughs> Family and friends matter. Keep making love. The world is life, fun, and energy. May be hard or easy, <laughs> but just change your mind and a better mood comes along. There you go, most common words. So that was a, like, a little frivolous question, a little bit of fun. But what's interesting for me is that in the process of playing with the data and giving myself permission to play with that data, I learned how to screen scrape. I got a great relationship with a Russian developer who will come in handy. I did the word frequency analysis, I did the graphics, so I taught myself a load of data handling skills and data skills through play. So play is actually a great way to teach yourself how to deal with data and how to get insights from data. So when you have a more serious question or a more journalistic inquiry or a more business oriented inquiry, you can use those skills, deploy those skills for, uh, for good results. Um, I added this one, I, started with, I did this for The Guardian. I uh, started with a really obvious question, act as a thread into some data. You probably know the answer to this, you saw it in the animation. Who has the biggest military budget in the world? You know it. The US, right, there it is. Massive, 711 billion, and there are the other top military budgets in the world. So vast is this military budget, they can gobble all those military budgets inside itself. Great, and then that might well chime, that number might well chime with your perception of uh, a political perception you might have of America's military might and their imperialistic whatevers, whatever. But 
Is it true that America has the large, largest military budget? Because you have to remember that America has a vast economy. It's fabulously rich. In fact, it can contain the other three top economies in the world inside itself. This is the combined GDPs of the states here. So its military budget is bound to be enormously, disproportionately huge. So to be fair and to be true, truer, we need to bring in another data set. And we need to say, well, who spends the most as a proportion of their earnings, as a percentage of their GDP? So that we just normalize the data according to that. So then you get a different picture. Suddenly, these other countries that were hidden by us using absolute figures spring into view, and the USA drops to sixth. So we're in this, this connected world now. It's no longer possible to take a single data set and claim truth, or a single data point even, and claim truth. It has to be connected to other data to be true, to be truer. And we can take this material, this data, and grind it up, create a lens, and so we can see the world in sharper focus, with more clarity. There's another um, practitioner in this field, Hans Rosling, that some of you may know, who's on TV this week, I think. And, you know, here's a great phrase. Let the data set change your mindset. Use it as a lens to sharpen your vision. You can do the same, by the way, for armies. You probably know this question. Who has the biggest army? China. China? Right, exactly. There you go. 2.1 million strong. And again, that might chime with the political perspective you have about China's territorial ambitions and its military complex. But again, China has a massive population. So to be fair, to be truer, we need to normalize it according to population size. And if you do that, the results are even more dramatic. Again, a bunch of countries spring into view, and China plummets to 124th. It actually has a tiny army for its size. So we need to connect data these days. We need, the modern way is to connect data, and that creates context. Context is a field of connections. And this field, is context provides meaning. So context is also a field of meaning that you can plug any data point and any data set into to suddenly start making intelligence, to start making understanding. As Oren was mentioning earlier, uh, the, the healthcare.gov site was, uh, went live a week ago or so, and a big t uh, there was a lot of talk about a million lines of code. It suddenly became a metric that everyone was tuned to. Um, and there was a lot of numbers circulating. And again, out of context, I didn't really understand. Is that a lot? Is a million a lot? Is 500 million a lot? What does it mean? So I gathered a load of these numbers together, and, and it created a little interesting retrospective into the history of code. So here are some, some code bases, how, many, how much code there is in certain things. Um, there's your million lines. A bacteria, if you count base pairs, there's about 2 million. The most complex climate model in the world is coming in around about a million lines. An F2 fighter jet has two million. Jurassic Park, we were told in the film, runs on two million lines of code. Pretty impressive. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope is about two million again. The Unreal Engine, a 3D games engine, similar. Windows 3.1, in 1992, had two million lines of code. Was that a reason why it was so rubbish? A <laughs> <laughs> uh, US military drone is about three million. Current version of Photoshop, cresting 4 million. OK, so we're on a journey now through million lines of code. Let's see if we look. We're getting bigger. Just the DVD player on the Xbox is nearly 5 million lines of code. The Curiosity rover is currently trumping around Mars, a similar amount. Chrome is coming in at about 7. Windows NT 3.5 in 1993 was, what is that, 8 million. The Chevy Volt, the latest electric car. Uh, Android, you can see, cresting up to 12 million. The latest Boeing avionics system is 14 million. Um, and the latest fighter jet from the US is, is coming up to 24 million. So we're getting bigger and bigger. Who's going to win this? Office 2001, 25 million lines of code. The latest version, a little larger. A uh, large Hadron Collider, the biggest scientific object in the world, is about 50 million lines of code. Facebook with backend code is about 62, and one of the more recent versions of Mac OS is up to 85 or so. So then we were told, but this healthcare government website, it's 500 million lines of code. Oh, really? So it's actually what? That's what, 10 Hadron Collider's worth? I don't know. <laughs> I smell something. So we need that context. We need the data connected to other data to be able to understand this stuff, to really to start deriving intelligence, stories, patterns, and connections. Um, so that's one kind of data. I, I, 
I believe that information is beautiful. I wondered if I can make my life beautiful. So I'm going to present my visualized CV. I want to give a little snapshot of where I'm coming from. As you can see, I was programming in my teens. Uh, I used to do assembly language and proper coding, you know, back in the day, Z80 and all that stuff. Any Z80 people here? 6086? Hmm, tumbleweeds, okay. <laughs> um, I love video games. I wrote about video games and then technology for wired and so on. Got, on, got into online, was, worked in advertising for a while, learning the power of the visual image. And then, as you can see, I've just been designing for, for a few years, not long. Um, I've never been to design school, never trained as a designer. I like to just learn by picking things up and playing. It's interesting, when I started doing that, though, I discovered something about myself. I already knew how to design. Not like I was good at it straight away, but more I had a sense of color and pattern and shape, an innate design sense. And I think it's because I was exposed to all this media in my career. It seeped in. I you know, trained myself inadvertently, accidentally. But I don't think I'm unique. I think this is happening to all of us. I think we're all looking at an information design medium every day, every second of every day. The internet is a perfect information design medium. And it's training us to expect our information in visual terms. So much so that the authority of one depends on the other. So you visit a, a shoddy website, how little you might trust the information on that website. You visit a glossy website, how little you might question the information on that website. So now the two go hand in hand, information and design. We're all visualizers. And I wonder if there isn't something, oh, yeah, sorry, I went to say it. So who recognizes this? OK, sorry, I'm doing a little survey of audiences. There's about 6% of you. OK, I designed this back in 2001. It's just, of all the things I've done in my career, that's the thing that actually I'm most famous for. OK, so. Uh, you know, I wonder if there isn't something cognitive about this, this visual sense that we all have now. Like, we're, our eyes are exquisitely sensitive to color, pattern, and shape. That's the language of the eye. And if you combine it with the language of the mind, which is numbers, ideas, and concepts, you start being able to speak two languages simultaneously, each enhancing the other. The language of the eye and the language of the mind. And we're always hunting for patterns. We're always looking for those two languages. That's what a visualization uses. Let me show you what I mean. This is a, a current snapshot of what's happening in the telecoms industry. Bit of a bun fight. Uh, everyone's suing everyone else. And there's a lot going on in this image, but let me just explain something to you. The blocks are, represent revenue year on year. And red companies have decreasing revenue year on year. Black companies have increasing revenue year on year. A lot going on, but I can drop down a, a level, take the bubbles out there explaining what the stories are about, why they're suing each other, drop down another. Now we're on the assembly language. Now we're on the visual layer, and that's just that visual layer. And here your eyes are exquisitely placed to answer a couple of questions. Is there a relationship between increasing litigiousness and decreasing revenue? Is there a relationship between size of company and increasing revenue? And that's not a perception you can necessarily make in a spreadsheet, but once you visualize it, you can see that quite straight away, the language of the eye level. Then we add on a conceptual level and a story level, and suddenly we've got an image that's working on multiple dimensions, on multiple layers, visual and informational. So this has led to this approach, data visualization has been uh, a new kind of camera, a new way of seeing the world. And, uh, you know, and I feel like sometimes, in my more glamorous moments, I feel like a photojournalist going out and taking snapshots of this wild data and bring it back. And a camera metal is actually really useful for describing some of the views you can get with this technique. Like for instance, you can take a satellite photo of some data, see it from above, and see what the patterns might be. Um, I had this quite boring data from the UN about drug use, the biggest drug use in countries. In the, in the world, and so I made a little story out of it. So here we go. These are the top eight drug using countries in the world cocaine, for cocaine. A little snapshot first. Um, then we can look at cannabis. I'm going to see a lot of Australia in this, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we have uh, ecstasy. A lot of Spain too, in fact. Um, then amphetamines, we drift off east. So patterns. And we can look at opiates, a bit kind of depressing photo, that one. Then we move to smoking, strange, strangely correlating. And then finally, drunks. <laughs> <laughs> so a little story there through the data, inserting a threshold and just tracing our way through. From above, I mean, geo is the obvious way of doing above views of data, but we can also do, we use the data itself to paint with. Um, this is Google Zeitgeist data, the most used, the most top search terms every year. Google releases this as a table and interactive. I quite think it makes quite a good sense to make it as a map. And I've been collecting this data for a while, so I have now a little time machine. This was the internet landscape back in 2006. Big Brother and Argos, the leading um, <laughs> search terms back in the olden days, 
And uh, the, the Yellow Pages is still an information resource in France. Fast forward to 2008, we've got eBay and BBC emerging. Um, and we've got YouTube beginning to take over French culture. Then 2009, uh, we've got BBC and Facebook. Uh, YouTube and Facebook, yep, beginning its ascent. Quite a lot of variety here, um, conceptually. Not so much variety in the United search terms of America, though. I think we've got lyrics, Yahoo, and games. Uh, I stopped at 2009 because beyond 2009, it's just all Facebook, basically. So, you know, using the data itself as a landscape, as a material to paint with, gives you an information map that you can explore your eyes. It just makes it more interesting. So we can be up high, and we can also crash zoom. So we can zoom down into a small bit of data that reveals a lot about a world. We had the IPO last week of Twitter. Some data I found, a little, little old, eight or nine months old, but a little, slightly different demographic data than you might have seen in the IPO report. A lot of, not so many active users as we might suspect. Um, so, so often a little crash zoom into a little number that can reveal quite a lot. Um, I love this statistic that I read from a Clay Shirky book. Clay Shirky is a New York academic. He talks about cognitive surplus of the minds around the world waiting for creative projects. 200 billion hours spent watching TV by US adults contrasted with the 100 million hours it took, to, sorry, you can't quite see the chair, 100 million hours it took to create something as awesome as Wikipedia. It's this big. So a little number can often reveal quite a lot. And in business intelligence in particular, on dashboards and so on, those little numbers really can drill into the, the board members' minds, can really be very memorable. It's interesting, though. I sketch a lot of my graphics before I do them. And can you see how big I thought 100 million was? Way out of scale, way out of proportion. Um, and that made me think, I wonder if that's used somehow. Because 100 million sounds like a lot of money. Is that used? Hmm. So I had a look around and I found this. A few years ago, uh, a bit of a rerun of what we've seen recently with the shutdown in America. The federal, President Obama was trying to pass the federal budget of America, the amount of money needed to run the actual government. 3,500 billion, more than the GDP of Germany. But of course, it was a time of austerity. So at the same time, he announced, well, we're going to cut 100 million. And was like, oh, well, that seems fair, 100 million, let's cut 100 million. Great, so let's just visualize that. 3,500 billion US federal budget, let's cut 100 million. <laughs> I'll move these chairs a little, there we are. Little tiny pixels. <laughs> so whenever you hear 100 million in the press or anywhere, that's your meerkat moment. That's your, that's your call to attention. What is going on? Something's going on, you're being distracted. So. Data visualization is like this camera. We can be up high, we can crash zoom, but it can also see the invisible. And data is an interesting material, an interesting soil, because it's somewhat invisible, and only when you start to gather it does it start to materialize. One type of data that I got obsessed with uh, a little while ago, on a bit of a I was on a bit of a health kick. I wanted to live to 150 years old. So I thought I would supplement, you know, I'd take a load of nutritional supplements, supercharge my diet. Uh, and then, of course, when I looked at the evidence for all these supplements, you know, any wheat, grass, so on, it just completely conflicting. So I looked at the data and I ended up just looking at all the data. So I created this massive graphic. It's actually called snake oil. So this is a balloon race. The higher up the diagram, the more evidence there is for a given supplement. And the bubbles here are sized according to popularity. Um, so you can see, is there a relationship, language of the eye, is there a relationship between efficacy and popularity? And we gathered loads of studies, we, we used some APIs, and we also did a lot of scraping. So we gathered them all, and we graded them all, and we were able to draw a line in the middle of the diagram and say, these supplements are worth taking, because the evidence is strong or, or very convincing. Some vitamin tea, green tea, dark chocolate, so on. And then these supplements below the line are still very not worth taking, because the evidence is um, substantially uh, weaker or, or absolutely non-existent. We took a long time to curate this data, uh, and took a long time to do it, but it's compressed now in just a little diagram. It's compressed into a visual image. I've done all the processing for you. You can just now just look at this diagram and drink it in. And that's one of the potentials of visualization, is compressing a huge amount of information in a small space. It's the MP3 of knowledge, in a way. Um, but we took a long time to build this data, and we hooked it up to the Google Docs API, so we were able to build some stuff on top of it. I think my beautiful assistant now is going to um, share with you a little interactive version that we have. we go. So this is plugged into the data, so we can um, instantly visualize it, update the data set, and then, of course, we can filter it if necessary. Uh, we can just look at cardio. Let's look at cardio. Brilliant. So we can just see, and we roll over, if you roll over the bubbles, it gives you more data and so on. And it's quite a good format. So I did a, a recent one using the same format, but looking at um, 
data breaches, so data security, big hack, the biggest hacks and breaches of the most recent years, the last 10 years. Again, plugged into a big data set that's open and live, and running off an API. And then you can see these are the biggest data breaches of the last 10 years, some massive ones there. And we can filter by tech, maybe. Let's have a look. There you go. You can see the recent Adobe hack, 38 million records lost. And we can scroll down and so on. And so we're given opportunity, not I had to play with this data to create it, but we give opportunity for audiences to play with the data, internal or external. You can use it, build a product on top of it. All right, so interactivity is a new frontier. Another type of data that's really important and really vital to not forget is qualitative data. So this is the uh, people's ideas, and sentiments, feelings um, of your customers, your users, your staff. And it also lends itself to visualization. Um, I'm going to use the example of the political spectrum. It's a graphic I created to try and understand where each side stands on the political spectrum. And it's a concept map, so it's made up of ideas, actually, and how it shows how they percolate down from government into individuals and background in a big cycle. And it's a great way of seeing through contrast how people, where people stand, where you might be on this, locate yourself on a political spectrum, different notions, different ideas. Um, what's interesting for me, I have to go back a little bit, when I was creating this image is I really found, I'm a journalist, slightly left-leaning, and I found that I really wanted this side to sound better than that side. And, but I couldn't do that because part of a, a visual graphic is you have to be balanced, so you create a broken image, a lopsided graphic. So part of my process, I had to really get into this side and really honor the perspectives in this side. And it wasn't too uncomfortable because ultimately I was just looking at an image. And Ultimately, that isn't as uncomfortable as hearing somebody's political views and feeling I have to defend against them. And there's a clue in the language. When you can see, I see what you mean. Oh, I see what you're thinking. Seeing and understanding and relating seem to be part of the same process, seem to open up the mind. And that's one of the potentials of data viz, I think, is to open the mind and allow different perspectives in to be able to see new kinds of data. And there are many new ways of visualizing data, as we saw the the Gartner boomerang, was it one I have not seen, not seen before, and new old ways of doing it um, for business intelligence, for storytelling, for, for analysis, for analytics, all different types of roles. So I encourage you to play and allow yourself to play with your data. And uh, I'll leave you with this, just a little meditation I had on what might make a great visualization. Um, so for me, it's the best of information and the best of design when you combine them best. So really good information, integrity, great data, really well structured, really good data, combined with interestingness. So back to that question, a really good question, a really good inquiry, a really good business goal to actually charge your inquiry. The best of design, functional, easy to use, iPad-ish, you know, beautiful, and then form. You know, it looks good, it's colorful, it attracts and has impact and memorability. I think when you combine all these things, in the middle you might get something that is an ideal, perfect data visualization. And when I say information is beautiful, I mean it in these four different ways, because there's a, a definition of beauty in each of these domains. Really good data, really well structured, that's beautiful data. A really great question, a really good inquiry is interesting, and interesting is the mind's word for beautiful. When the mind finds something captivating, it's interesting, the sensation is interesting and then it's easy to use, and it's beautiful to use, it's a beautiful experience. And then finally, the traditional notion of beauty, uh, aesthetically beautiful. So information is beautiful, combines all those things into one thing, beauty of data, beauty of um, gathering it and analyzing it and making it into stuff that you can share. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Actually, we had quite a few questions um, sourced through, um, through Twitter, one of which I, um, I had absolutely no idea what it meant, but um, perhaps you do know, which uh -huh. is, do you use the standard unit of whales to visualize data? Whales? I, who, who asked that question? I couldn't tell if it was, if it was a joke or if it would. <laughs> Why did you? <laughs> Why? Why did you pick that one? <laughs> <laughs> so intriguing. Whales. Yeah, I was. I wasn't sure if that was perhaps some some data visualization term that I that I didn't. Uh... No, so like every three minutes. Okay. Um, you know, uh, standard units of whales 
the area of Wales is cut down. In oh, I see Wales. Wales, right. You know, Russia emits five whales. Oh yeah, or Olympic yeah. stadiums is another one I hear, like, yeah. oh yeah, 60 oh, Olympic stadiums. Oh, so, stadiums, like, so yeah. like filling it up with whales or something, like, okay, okay. Yeah. Wales the country, yeah. Wales the... <laughs> oh, oh no, because I think it was spelled like Wales, the, it may have auto-corrected. Um, I, 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 I thought, I, thought it, I, I read it as... as but I think that's a peril, you get, there, there is a... Like the spelling correct on an Intel, Intel Ultrabook. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> well Wales. that doesn't make us look very good. <laughs> But I think there is, there is, like, you can get cliches in any domain. I think that's become, stuff like that is becoming cliche. It's a danger to make your, your data a bit too popsy, a bit too poppy, a bit too generic or cliched, yeah. Um, another question that, um, that someone had on Twitter is uh, a, little, a little more uh, straight, straightforward. I think, what is, what's your experience with, um, with the use of APIs in general to collect data? Which ones, are, um, which ones work well? Which ones, mm -hmm. which, which, what annoys you about the process? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people in the audience who are coming from a, um, perhaps the, the technology side who mm -hmm. would be interested in finding out how, um, how things can perhaps be improved for someone such as yourself who is, yeah. who is tapping into APIs for collecting data. Yeah, I find them very useful for the live, live data stuff that we do, obviously. Um, I'm a bit locked out because although I was a programmer in my youth, I was uh, I sort of lost that ability. It's, it's around about the time my daughter was born, that part of my brain just kind of melted. Um, so uh, I have to work through proxies. I work through work with coders and developers, and um, we do uh, about 20, 25 percent of our data is gathered from through APIs. But I'd, my process is often I start with the question. So I start with the inquiry and the idea and the question, and then I find the data. So I seek out the APR, I seek out the, the best route to gather and structure that data. So um, I don't often start with APIs and data, I, I do the other way around. Um, but I'm finding, when I first did the book back in 2008, there was nothing. It was a wasteland. And there, a data was either locked away or stuck in PDFs or just not available. And it's, the landscape has completely changed. It's actually it's unbelievably, unbelievably exciting now to be able to just tap in and plug in at any point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are there things that you, that you think are, are still uh, kind of general sort of industry-wide challenges that you, that you encounter? Well, I think Oren mentioned it, and still there's this little fear, this tremor of fear that goes through an organization or uh, when, they, when they think of sharing their data and opening it up and this fear of violation or data breaches or somehow that somebody's going to take the data and reinterpret it in a way that's discomforting for their organization. <laughs> and I encounter that quite a lot. There's often a bit of resistance to it, but I think as, you, as Aaron was saying, it's so much, um, so many products and so much vitality being created through APIs, it's, it, it, the resistance is melting more strongly. Another question from Twitter, um, how do we know that we can trust the sources and assumptions and interpretation of data? Um, yeah. Obviously, they're, they're sort of great promises of transparency through visualizing data, but, but how, how, how do we know that we, that we, can, that we can trust the, the data itself and then also who's interpreting it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I mean, you can, you can lie with statistics and you can really lie with visualized statistics because it has the power of numbers and data and the power of design. So it's a double barrel, both barrels, very powerful, very hard to argue with. I think transparency is the, one of the keys. We, every single graphic you've seen, every single graphic online we have is paired with a, a, a Google Doc. We have everything open in a Google Doc so you can go in, see the data, and even we catalog our process as well, so you can see the decisions we've made at key points, so we're as open as we can be without slowing ourselves down. And about 20, 25% of people look at the graphics, click through and read the data as well. So I think transparency has to go hand in hand with the visualization or else, yeah, you can't really trust, you don't know what's been going on with the data. One more question um, that, that might be something that, that kind of turns into additional questions, because uh, we, we have a couple more minutes. Um, okay. the, role of, um, the role of data in the enterprise, um, mm -hmm. in terms of order and organization and structure, uh, or, or the, I, I would say less the, less the role of data and more the, more the role of design, since I think that's a little bit more um, I, uh, not quite understood by mm. uh, the, the corporate world in general. Yeah. Obviously design is, um, there's, there's UX design, there's, there's marketing design, there's, mm -hmm. uh, should, should those perhaps be be consolidated for a more consistent story. You know, where mm. where do you see design currently lying in um, the business world in general, but particularly large businesses? Yeah. And then also, where should it be? Yeah, that's a good question. 
There is quite a bit of debate in this realm, in the business intelligence world around visualization, how much design should be involved. It's quite a, a maybe more of a conflict, I would say, than a debate. Um, there's a sense that in internal communications, visualization should be utilitarian in their approach, so they should be just very functional, not too designery, and convey the maximum intelligence as succinctly as possible to whoever needs it. Um, but my feeling is uh, it, it's really a battle for attention. It, if you, ex if you share something externally, public, you need to get people's attention, but also you need to get attention internally or horizontally from your teams or your staff, but also vertically to the board or whoever. So all these people are looking at visual material all the time and they're trained, as we were seeing, to just be drawn to stuff that's colourful and interesting and your image, your visualisation competes with that, competes with everything that's out there. So there's no sense in not designing something to sharpen its clarity or to make it more impactful or memorable, I think. It's a big step for an organisation to make because obviously it takes an additional amount of time, but I think it's worth it because it, it just has, it then just has more power and transmittability with, within your organisation or publicly. And if you design something really well, there's no reason why it has to stay internal. It can go to marketing, it can go outside the industry or outside your organisation. It can be used in lots of different ways, lots of different uh, media. Cool. Bonus question, most surprising thing, uh, maybe it was the hundred, hundred just how, how small a hundred million thing is, most surprising thing you've ever discovered by assuming one thing and then putting it in context through visuals? Yeah, I mean, I, the Twitter thing quite surprised me. Um, I didn't realize how many, how many bots there were on Twitter. Uh, yeah, 500 million lines of code, I just, I couldn't believe that how much capital was made out of that number and it, how utterly bogus it was. So, yeah. who, who made it up? Is it was it? in the New York, New York Times, it was a number from the New York Times. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Have, have they been, were, did, were you the one who kind of called them out on it, or was that uh, something Yeah, I think the image went round quite yeah. a lot. I, I'm sure other people were scoffing, but I, I managed to I sort of put it in context. So like, this is like can make three, their own minds. three large hadron colliders yeah. or something like that. That's so one hell of a that. website. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. Thank great you. Great opening